Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Pryo. I'm the executive director of the university's President's Business Council and a member of the class of 1989. I hope that you and your families are well and that we are closer to a time when we can resume our in-person university gatherings. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our PBC welcome, uh, webinar with keynote remarks. Our webinars are designed as a way to continue offering opportunities to engage with our alumni, parents, friends, and students while sharing keynote remarks on the experiences and areas of expertise of members of our broader University of Scranton community. We are grateful to your continued support of our webinar programming. Tonight's viewing audience again spans the country and represents all the university's constituents from alumni in the class of 1963 through current students, including a few from the incoming class of 2025. Before we move into tonight's program, allow me to do some housekeeping by pointing out the features of the Zoom webinar platform that we are using. With this webinar, you have the ability to submit questions for our keynote speaker using the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. We will have some time at the end of the presentation for questions, but we suggest submitting your questions during the presentation, and we will do our best to have them answered along with those questions that we received during the registration process. For optimal viewing, we recommend you select full screen mode on the top right corner of your screen. Finally, tonight's webinar is being recorded and you can view our past webinars on our PBC website at scranton.edu slash PBC. Our agenda for tonight's program includes remarks from our PBC chair, Frank Pern. Frank will introduce our university president, Dr. Jeff Gingrich, who will provide us with an update on the university. Our PBC chair, Elizabeth Madden, our vice chair, Elizabeth Madden, will introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Jack Lynch of the class of 1983, who will deliver his remarks entitled, Living Through a Pandemic, It's All About Teamwork. Now let me turn our program over to the PBC chair. Member of the class of 1983, Frank Pern is the Global Chief Compliance Officer at J.P. Morgan Chase in New York City and a former member and vice chair of the university's board of trustees. We are fortunate to have him as our PBC chair and grateful for his tireless commitment to the university. Frank? You got it. So we're back a year later. We're still doing this on, uh, on a webinar. We've had some great content this past year and tonight's no exception. Um, on behalf of the PBC and my co-chair, Elizabeth Madden, we're really excited to have everybody. We hope you're all doing well. And we really are excited that uh, my classmate, Jack Lynch, is here to talk about what he's learned and done leading you know, a group of first line responders during this horrible pandemic. Jack and I spent many nights, days together at the university a long time ago. Um, we were very close, we had very dear friends and I'm thrilled with the success that he's, had, he's achieved in this healthcare industry. And I know he's got some very, very interesting remarks prepared and we're excited about that. We started these webinars, as I said, a year ago in lieu of being able to get together um, as a community Hopefully we'll be able to end these sooner rather than later and get together. Tim will talk a little bit possibly about, you know, the future for our dinners and the PBC. Um, hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel here. All right. You know, we lost a great leader earlier this year in Father Pilar's um, university's board of trustees and administration, I think did a fantastic job in, in finding, you know, some a replacement for somebody that's almost irreplaceable. But Father Marina will join us, I think next week. I spoke with him about a month or so ago, talked about the PBC, talked about you know, what's so special about the university and what he was going to, to, to find when he got here. And I don't think he can be more excited. He seems like a really great individual and I'm really excited about his leadership. Uh, in, the, in the interim, we've had Dr. Jeff Gingrich. Um, Jeff joined the university back in 2018 as our provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, and he's been our acting university president since February. Um, he's done a great job executing on his responsibilities, 
And from everything that I've heard and has been reported, he's done it seamlessly. Um, and, you know, I personally, Jeff, want to thank you on behalf of the PBC and all of the folks on the phone. That, that was not easy. We know that. And by all accounts, you've done a fantastic job. So thank you very, very much. And with that, let me turn it over to you, Jeff, for a university update. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim, for those kind words. And uh, it, it really has truly been an extraordinary year. And I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, and as always, for your extraordinary support. Um, you know, it's difficult to, to, to know how to give a campus update after such an extraordinary year. And I think I've used the word extraordinary or extraordinary more times this year than ever in my life. Um, it's been a tough and challenging year and no one was truly prepared for what we encountered with the COVID pandemic. And I know you all understand is that you, you've encountered similar things in your own personal lives and in your careers. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Jack talk a little bit about um, uh, how he, about leadership through the, these times. Um, what I can say is how proud I am of our campus community and how everyone went above and beyond in so many ways to take care of each other. It really was, despite all the challenges, it was, um, it, it was awe-inspiring to watch faculty, staff, and especially students um, take care of each other this year. And I often would walk across campus and, and see students wearing their masks, staying six feet apart, eating, you know, with a plexiglass window in front of them and just, um, you know, just I feel sorry for them that, that, that they weren't experiencing the full college experience and yet they, they continued to move on like everyone else did. And uh, it was kind of in that true Scranton spirit that, that we did. Um, likewise, we are so grateful for all of your support. Uh, there's been no year in which we've relied more on the support and the love of our alumni and our friends um, of the university. Uh, so especially on behalf of, of our students, uh, particularly, I wanted you all to know how grateful we are for being there for us and for your continued love and support for the University of Scranton. That's been particularly important this year. Um, I, maybe one of the things I'm the most proud about this year is the fact that we not only kept the boat afloat and just survived this year, but we, we really continue to thrive and grow and, and innovate. And so uh, we have new programs uh, moving forward in mechanical engineering and business analytics and speech and hearing and um, applied behavior analysis and in a number of areas. And, um, uh, and, and that's just a testimony to our, to our faculty, particularly who continue to kind of think about what's in the best long-term interest of our of our students and um, how do we prepare them for the world beyond us? Um, we, uh, we, we innovated like crazy and we were incredibly creative this year. And so about half of our, not quite half of our classes were remote, offered remotely this year. Um, we continued to keep a full uh, campus presence though. So most of our students were on campus throughout the year. Um, I was really amazed that we were able to keep our positivity rates uh, for COVID really low, less than 1% uh, throughout most of the semester, even though we were randomly testing on a regular basis. And so I think that's a tribute and a testimony to the fact of each person kind of doing what they needed to do and, and uh, following the rules and taking care of each other. As we said, our sports teams continued to, to work. We weren't able to have quite as many games as we wished we would have had, but, um, uh, but we continued to allow those, those student athletes to move forward. Uh, amidst everything, as uh, Frank uh, mentioned, uh, our campus community was able to pull together and support each other when we lost our beloved pastor, our leader, our friend, and our president, uh, Father Scott Pilars. Um, Scott truly modeled for us. It was really amazing to watch um, uh, his courage throughout this past year, um, continuing to lead, even though he is, he, as he battled his own health issues. Um, and I know that many of you knew him longer and better than I did and also called him a friend. And uh, I want you to know how much he, he loved this university. His famous words of don't waste love were, was also another model for us. Uh, there's nobody who loved this university more and more importantly, the people in it. And um, 
you know, Scott was thrilled, as many of you know, though, because before he really, his health began to really decline, we were able to choose a new president. And he was even more thrilled to know that it was Father Joe Marina, who arrives next week. Um, we're, we can't wait to welcome him. Um, Father Marina comes to us from Lemoyne University. He was the provost there, but he has a long history in Catholic and Jesuit higher education. And um, one of the things that, that impressed us most and has impressed me most particularly has been how student-centered Joe has been as he talked, as he interviewed and talked about this job. Um, he continued to talk about students and placing students at the center of everything that, that we do. And that's such, again, that's such a Scranton way of doing things. And we're really excited about having him come on, on campus here. So thank you to everyone. Uh, special thanks to Jack Lynch to, for tonight for being here. I, I moved up here from the main line of Philadelphia where I worked at Cabrini University. And Jack is known as one of the greatest leaders on the main line, uh, not only in the Philadelphia region, through, throughout the state and country as well. And so we're really proud to have him as a graduate of the University of Scranton and uh, really grateful for him talking with us tonight. I want to thank everyone for all your support. Uh, the PVC continues to be a very special event for us, and we're really looking forward to being together in, in person, celebrating like we always do in the great Scranton way. So thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we, we so appreciate all of your support. Thank you. Jeff, thanks very much for those remarks and uh, for participating tonight. More importantly though, I would like to thank you for your leadership during the past year, uh, particularly during your time as acting president. We know it was a difficult task all around, but the entire university community is grateful for the way that you and your fellow president's cabinet members, many of whom are joining us tonight, responded to all of the challenges during the past 16 months. I'm now gonna ask Elizabeth Madden of the class of 1996, our PVC vice chair, and a principal with Davidson Kempner Capital Management in New York City to introduce Jack Lynch. As I was thinking about my introduction of Elizabeth, there were so many things that came to mind with respect to her longtime commitment to the university. And I think the most telling is that like Frank Pern, Elizabeth has been engaged with the PVC since the beginning 20 years ago. In fact, I remember our meetings uh, early meetings in the early days when we sat around the table at the AXA boardroom in New York City and Elizabeth was joining us via conference call during her time in Hong Kong with Goldman Sachs. So Elizabeth, this year has allowed us to add Zoom to the many ways that you have stayed connected and uh, thank you for your continued commitment. Um, you. Th thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, yes, I'm thrilled that Zoom is now in our repertoire versus uh, uh, those conference calls sometimes with a lot of static on the line as well. So this is this is much progress and it's been a privilege um, to be involved over the last 20 years and to just really see the growth of the PBC and um, see so many um, familiar names that are joining us here this evening and, and a number of new folks as well. So thank you for being here. Um, now on to tonight's keynote speaker. Um, we shared uh, a link to Jack's bio in the invitation. We've heard a lot about him this evening, but just allow me to share a couple more highlights about him and his success. Um, Jack has served as president and CEO of Mainline Health since 2005, providing executive leadership to suburban Philadelphia's most comprehensive healthcare system. During his tenure with Mainline, Jack and his leadership has been credited with strengthening the organization's commitment to safety, quality, equity, and enhancing the technology necessary to support significant advances in those areas. He's also fostered a period of expansion and has cultivated an employee work environment that's garnered recognition from several independent rating organizations. Prior to joining Mainline Health, Jack served nearly 20 years as an executive with St. Luke's Episcopal Healthcare System in Houston, advancing to the position of executive vice president and chief operating officer. While in Houston and continuing now in the greater Philadelphia area, Jack has served on several professional boards in addition to those of education and nonprofit organizations. Jack is a native of Washington, DC, an alumnus of Gonzaga Catholic High School. He received his undergraduate degree in management from the university and a master's in health administration from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Please join me in welcoming Jack. Elizabeth, thank you. I'm gonna take you on the road with me for all my introductions. I love it. Um, 
I want to thank Frank and Tim and Jeff as well for their comments uh, and for the leadership they've provided the university and the university community. Uh, before I get started, though, I know there's a number of people on the call that have fond memories of a dear friend of many of ours, and that is Mark Moisey. Uh, unfortunately, and I think the, the relationship of my presentation about leading through a pandemic and Mark uh, succumbing to uh, COVID uh, really makes it appropriate for me to start with a moment of silence uh, in memory of Moisey and in honor of his family and all of his friends that cared so much about Mark. Okay, thank you very much. So I was in a bar this afternoon, early this evening to have dinner. It wasn't really a bar trip. It was just to go across the street in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And I went to a place called La Cabra Brewing. And after talking to the owner and telling him that I couldn't have a beer because I was getting ready to do a Zoom, it dawned on me I probably could have a beer because I was getting ready to do a Zoom with the University of Scranton alum. Uh, I'm probably would have been in good places with most of you right now. Uh, he said, where did you go to school? I said, oh, the University of Scranton. He said, oh, you're in the right place. He then proceeded to pull out of the free refrigerator a beer called Scranton Fancy with the logo of the Electric City. Now, I don't know how many of you know about this beer. I've not tasted it, but I just thought it was kind of strange to be sitting at this brewery slash barbecue place. So what I want to talk about tonight is leading through a pandemic, and I want to give all of you a window into all of the alumni uh, of medical support, medical caregivers, uh, hospital personnel, and quite frankly, essential workers. And before I do that, I want to thank everybody that's involved in delivering health care in any form or fashion, uh, because we have a lot of alum out there that have dedicated their careers to health care. Let's see if I get this to go right. Um, so in March, on March 8th, I was down watching the Philadelphia Phillies play in spring training. I got a call from uh, one of the leaders at Paoli Hospital. He said, Jack, we've just gotten word that we have a patient in the ED with uh, COVID. It was our first COVID case. It was on March 8th. And we really, as a country, didn't really know what was ahead of us. And I would say that the last 15 months have been unlike anything I ever prepared for or even could have imagined. Uh, we immediately assembled a team. And by the way, if I use the word I in any of this presentation, I want someone to zap me because this is all about we. And my presentation is about teamwork. And um, our team jumped into action right away. Uh, and just to give you a sense as to what was going on, we immediately established tiers, tier one, tier two, tier uh, 2B, 2A, 2C. And that was how many beds could we put together. So tier one was how many beds did we have in our hospitals? Tier 2A was how many beds could we get in our ambulatory sites? Tier 2B was our partners, if we had a joint venture that may have had ambulatory surgery beds. And tier 2C was going off campus. Um, and so we looked at every possible situation. And then our stats folks uh, put together projections based on national uh, models. And if you look at the gray curve on this, that was the potential volume that we would be expecting at Mainline Health. Our peak was at about 270, uh, both back in April and then again in December. We did the same thing for our, um, can't move that fast. Uh, for our intensive care unit, you can see we got very close to running out of intensive care unit beds. And we also were well protected in terms of ventilators of any potential demand for our ventilators. And this is really a sad slide. It shows you that as of last March, we had lost 151 people uh, to COVID uh, that we had cared for. And today it's over a thousand uh, patients. We established the System Incident Command Center, and unlike some of the organizations we got to see on TV where they put all of their people in the one room and all of the decision makers for that organization, or for that matter, our country, were in the same room, we broke up into three specific teams and made sure that the teams were equally staffed with the talent. And so uh, this was a room, uh, picture of the room before we got into social distancing and uh, only when we had to wear masks, that room looked very different a couple weeks later with partitions and fewer people. Uh, the incident command was set up, and I, I share this slide only to show that we had an incident command, infectious disease, infection prevention, occupational health, communications, nursing, human resources, information technology, logistics, emergency prep, administrative support, and one that nobody would have guessed, but turned out to be an incredible talent 
was a performance improvement engineer that helped us uh, on a lot of initiatives. Uh, the communications team was absolutely essential. We found out throughout this entire pandemic, even in, up until today, if you communicate effectively to your patients, to your employees, to your medical staff, uh, and do it regularly and with the utmost transparency, you eliminate all of the questions, you eliminate all of the, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? And so the why was really important in our communications. We hold weekly communications uh, town halls. I did, I think, probably my 65th town hall today. Uh, we do it for about an hour and we're unbelievably transparent. Our human resources team, when you think about the policies that were impacted by COVID, our furlough policy, our housing policy, downstaffing, employee exposure, travel guidance, benefit changes, remote work, all the things that affected the lives of our employees, we had to have a team on the ready to make those policy updates after decisions were made. The transitioning to remote work, you know, we had very few people that worked remotely. And what we learned through the pandemic with about 1500 people working remotely was a lot of those people probably can work remotely forever. Um, but a lot of those people need to come back and we're bringing our folks back that will be coming back around July 1st. But the IT team deployed over 1500 laptops in less than a week. And it was just amazing to see them uh, in action. Our supply chain and materials management folks were tasked and challenged like they've never been before. Everything you saw on TV was worse. The PPE, personal protective equipment shortages in this country were unbelievable. I signed an okay to send $1.6 million to a Chinese company. And unfortunately to date, we've not seen any of the product that they said they were gonna send to us. That's all, that's the only one I got burned on. But our team worked tirelessly 24 seven with suppliers and non-suppliers and certainly non-traditional suppliers across the country and across the globe seeking personal protective equipment. Our number one priority was to protect our employees. And the second part of that number one priority was to protect our patients. And I couldn't protect our patients if we didn't protect our employees. To date, we've exceeded over $40 million in expenses on personal protective equipment. Our infection prevention and infectious disease personnel were unbelievable. We just had a retirement of what we described in the proclamation, our own Dr. Fauci. And so one of the things that I was blessed with was instead of our team relying on the newspaper or the TV or the internet for expertise, we had our own experts that were certainly following the country's experts, but also had their own expertise. And it was around remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, uh, monoclonal antibodies, what's the latest treatment, proning patients, and they were all working together. We also were regularly responding to the Department of Public Health, or Department of Health and what they referred to as their Hans, and um, they were constantly coming out with new uh, requirements for us in the healthcare uh, environment. We were monitoring outbreaks in the community, and we were looking at our internal and external subject matters to try and inform those of us that were having to make the decisions. The personal protective equipment guidelines were overwhelming. One minute the masks weren't important, the next minute they were. And then all of a sudden we needed, we learned that we needed to have eye protection. And so we call, we created these PPE people uh, and made it very clear in our communications and in posters around the organization, what was the level of protection that you needed based on the environment that you were in. And so to this day, we still are uh, requiring PPE for patients and for caregivers, as well as all of us working in the hospital buildings. Our testing teams were phenomenal. And you saw early on the stories and the horror stories about people trying to get tested. For a little while, the only place you could get tested was a state lab. And then once that sort of was overwhelmed, then you had to go to a commercial lab. And that could be up to three, four, five, six days before you got results. Finally, our teams were able to get uh, both the technology as well as the reagents. But our folks spent countless hours trying to secure that technology and the, the, the reagents to be able to do those tests. Obviously with this kind of event, setting up a call center was really, really important. And remember all of these teams I'm pulling out of our workforce. Uh, and we, got, we were able to do that somewhat once the elective admissions went down because I had personnel that weren't doing elective cases anymore or elective work. And so we could deploy them into different roles. Um, but our call center teams, we had an employee exposure line uh, that dealt with questions related to travel and exposure guidance. 
Uh, we had COVID Communication Center, uh, where we gave patients and employees and, and people we tested results. We had our incident command centers. And so these teams were getting thousands of calls a day. Uh, and at the time we first set them up, they were in central locations. We ultimately distributed them uh, remotely. So one of the best kept secrets and probably the scariest thing about COVID was we were hitting capacity challenges and resource allocation issues. And you've seen stories on the news about India. You may have seen some stories about New York. You certainly saw stories recently about Michigan, but it happened in this state. And I'm blessed to tell you that Mainline Health, and I don't believe any of us in Philadelphia faced the challenges that we were prepared for uh, because um, of too much demand. Uh, but we had to go to an auxiliary model of care. And so if you look at the green where uh, the care priority is what's called three, and you look at the list of things that are under the green, the red, and the yellow, that's what nurses do when they're caring for patients. When we got to certain levels of census and the volume and acuity of the patients were so sick, we literally went to care priority one. And so some of the things that you would expect to get when you came in the hospital, as a patient, you weren't getting them. And it killed the nurses to have to not do everything that they know they're so committed to do. We changed the way they documented everything to streamline the process of care. New York Times recently came out, or came out in the pandemic talking about how the coronavirus may force doctors to decide who can live and who can die. That's stuff you read about. That's not stuff you would ever dream of that would occur in the United States. But yet hospitals and doctors were forced to pre prepare for what do we do if we run out of resources. In fact, the Pennsylvania Department of Health published interim guidelines called Crisis Standards of Care for the Pandemic. Uh, if you want to read some scary stuff, look at this document. But basically, the purpose of the document was to guide the allocation of patient care resources during an overwhelming public health emergency uh, where, dema where demand dramatically exceeds the supply. Who would have ever thought, for all of you that were in the science programs at, at, uh, at the university and you went on to medical school, you were never, ever told that you might get into a situation where in the United States, you'd be limited on your resources available. The guidelines would be triggered based on an event of a large portion of the state's population, lack of critical shortage of essential equipment, medications, oxygen, OR equipment, people, PPE shortages, and critical infrastructures. Uh, I, I put this slide in there because I know a bunch of you took an ethics class and wondered, you know, when will I use this? I used it every day, and I still use it every day. The ethical framework to make sure that it was a just process in how that allocation of resources was made. And our chief, our, direct, our uh, committee chair of our ethics program was instrumental in helping guide us through all of this uh, decision making. You know, how do the values guide the allocation? It's to maximize benefits, save the most lives, save the most life years, tough stuff. Uh, if you look down, given priority to the worst off, the sickest first and the youngest first, the sickest used when it aligns with maximizing benefits. I mean, this is stuff that none of our caregivers ever thought they would have to face. And I share with you, fortunately, they didn't have to face it, but we had to prepare for the potential that we were going to run out of resources. Our team members, you'll see, are almost all clinicians. A critical care dyad, an ECMO dyad. ECMO is a, is a, a, a technology that we use on patients in the ICU. Uh, we have a limited number of ECMO machines, and so it very easily could have gotten to a point where you had more demand than you had capacity. The emergency department dyads are, are hospital service physicians, uh, regional triage leaders, uh, our Crisis Standards Resource Committee. That was the committee that was going to evaluate if we only had X number of ventilators and we had X plus number of patients. That resource committee would be responsible for evaluating who was going to get those ventilators. So celebrating our nurses, and, and we've really celebrated all of our staff, and I've got a couple videos, but I want to share this one during Nurses Week uh, that we put out that really captures, again, tremendous teamwork. Get used to the frontline warriors, to being brave for all of us. You didn't have to make him laugh or hold her hand like that. You didn't have to love, but you did just to make them all feel better, yeah. You didn't have to pray all night. You didn't have to risk your life. If everybody loved like you did, the world would be a whole lot better.
to being brave for all of us. Amazing teamwork. But you've got a lot of nurses and, and other clinical workers that really probably the last time they had a patient die was when they were in nursing school uh, because they work on an orthopedic unit or they work in an ambulatory site. We deployed those nurses all over the hospital. And so at one point we decided we needed to create end of life support teams. These are individuals that volunteered to go to the bedside of our dying COVID patients who didn't have family members because of the visiting requirements or lack of visiting ab ability. Uh, that was an amazing decision our clinical teams came up with. And the fact that we had more people volunteer to be on those end of life support teams to support the caregivers that were literally watching patients die, multiple patients die per shift. Uh, we also had teams rounding across the system to support them. And we talk a lot about psychological first aid and mental health resources. One of you asked a question early on in the, before the program about our support of our, pro, our employees. Managing their health was really, really important to us. We have a CERT team, which is a critical incident response team that we can deploy people 24 seven to a situation where team members need support. We have a um, employee assistance program, we have chaplains, uh, and we have behavioral health. And the beauty of being in healthcare, those resources are at my fingertips. We were able to deploy those resources to support our staff. We also had a check going home checklist, acknowledging that it was a difficult day. You know, I used to talk about the fact that when you come to work, you gotta leave your backpack at the door. Stuff that happens at home isn't the patient's problem. It's not your coworker's problem. I used to believe you could also leave the backpack of stuff we put in your backpack uh, on the way out. I lost a patient. Uh, a friend of mine died. Uh, all the things that can happen at work. And what I've concluded, and I wished I'd been able to say this a long time ago, but I didn't conclude it until COVID is, those backpacks aren't things you can take off. And so we work really hard at supporting our staff, both with the stuff we put in the backpack uh, from the experiences they had at work, as well as the stuff they're experiencing which was even exacerbated during COVID. So this is what the COVID admission curve looks like. I show this only for illustration purposes of, you know, and I could ask a couple of you probably what were the dates, you know, March, April was when we hit the pandemic peak uh, early on and December was right after Thanksgiving and everything we were war warned about happened. Now Christmas holidays and New Year's holiday did not see a third spike for us. But if you look at the slope of the next curve, um, and so this just shows you what yesterday was. We have seven inpatients. But if you look at these curves, that's our daily census. And what you'll note, if, even if you weren't a statistics student like I was, took it twice, it's another story. Uh, the slope of the curve is um, much smaller in the first spike, but the second spike, it just felt like it was never gonna go away. And finally, we got down to 80, from 270 to 80, 180, 100, 180, and just wouldn't go down until about six or eight weeks ago and it started to plummet. And as I said today, we're at 10. I wanna share another video because one of the things I, I really made a big deal about was how important our housekeepers were. And you know, the country realized how important essential workers are, the bus driver, the, the restaurant worker, the bank teller, um, but our housekeepers were absolutely essential. All right, it is now time for PHL 17 Rising Heroes, when we shine a light on the people who are doing amazing things in our communities to help us all get through this coronavirus pandemic. And today, our Kyrie Stewart is highlighting some of the not so known heroes of the pandemic. He joins us now live from Center City. Kyrie. Well, guys, there's been a a lot of love and appreciation shown towards medical workers these past few weeks, but what about the ones that are helping to keep the hospitals clean? Well, I spoke with one woman who said that she's proud to do her part to help save lives. We're making a difference. We're making a change. We are making a change in the lives of the people who come in this hospital. Hello, how are you? Gwendolyn Brown is one of 100 members of Mainline Health's environmental services team. They go room to room, hall to hall, making sure all services are cleaned and shelves are stocked. We are constantly sanitizing, making sure all hand sanitizers, soaps are always Fill, paper tissues are always filled, making sure a high dust and low dust and throughout the whole entire hospital and patient rooms are um, 
done. The environmental services team is responsible for making sure the hospitals stay squeaky clean and free of possible cross contamination. Keeping things clean and tidy in hospitals is always important, but now their jobs are even more serious as hospitals continue to fill up with COVID-19 patients. Even though we're here for patient care, we have to make sure that we're safe so that we can do our jobs. Brown says her team constantly meets with management to discuss safety measures, and they always make sure they're wearing proper protection when cleaning. But she says they can't do it alone. Everyone has a part. By wearing your mask, by hand washing your hands, using the hand sanitizer. If you did it 10 times, do it 15 times. It doesn't hurt anything. It really helps us out. Brown hopes just shows everyone that even though the doctors and nurses are doing a great job, some heroes are not always seen. There's no big jobs. There's no little jobs. There's a job that has to be done. And doing that job, we have to do it together. How well did she capture it? This Brown is one of our rock stars, and I think it really underscores the important role. So that was obviously before the, the vaccine became available or she would have told you to get vaccinated. But, you know, hope was clearly on the horizon uh, back in December. I'm going to skip this video because of time, but we had, there was a great story on Fox 29 about it. this man who was in the hospital, I believe, over 50 days, was being discharged from uh, Bryn Mawr Rehab, um, multiple hospital visits, uh, and went home healthy and safe and truly believed that his family was planning his funeral and our staff got to watch these celebrations in fact we played the rocky theme song and still do every time a covid patient gets discharged we play it over the loudspeaker throughout the institution so you know there are crazy things you do as a leader um my chief operating officer and i dressed up as um frosty the snow person and uh, it happened to be the day that we received our first pizza box of COVID vaccine. And literally the box is about this big and it has, uh, that was a Pfizer box and it needs to be stored in an ultra cold store freezer. Uh, that's Amy Benner with me, with the two of us. And um, she was responsible for making sure that she received and then dispersed or dispensed all of our vaccine material. We did our first vaccine on December 18th. Uh, this is our chief of infectious disease demonstrating that he's got confidence in the vaccine and over we began vaccinating our employees uh, very focused around uh, making sure our workforce was safe they were all in category 1a and so we spent a couple weeks making sure that as many of them could be vaccinated as possible and today not nearly 11,000 employees and medical staff have been vaccinated we knew we were going to have a problem before the pan the, the uh, vaccine came out with um, hesitancy. And in fact, we started tracking vaccine rates of acceptance with our staff by race and ethnicity from day one. And I'm very proud that we have over 70% of our employees vaccinated, uh, but I'm very sickened and sad that 53% of our African-American employees have been vaccinated, which means 47% have not. We have a COVID um, competence committee I'll talk about. We also said as soon as we're going to start vaccinating members of the community, I want 25% of our vaccine going in the arms of the underserved uh, into minority individuals. And so we didn't hit the 25%, but uh, almost 13% of the vaccines we gave out in the community went to Black and African American, 4.6 to unspecified, 3.76 to Asians, and a very low number for Hispanics. Uh, but we're working with all of those communities to increase vaccination rates. We jumped on the bandwagon very early on. And uh, quite frankly, I hope there are no Department of Health people on the call, but we offered vaccines to the SEPTA, which is the local um, bus and rail transportation group uh, in January. They were not in category 1A, 1B. They were at risk and they were 85% minorities. So we held an amazing event at one of our vaccine sites where they bust uh, their workers in. I think we vaccinated 350 people that day and 150 people the next day. Uh, again, also reaching out to first responders. We took vaccinating our community very seriously. We worked very hard. Uh, the governor and the secretary of health on our way to Washington decided to take categories 1A, 1B, and 1C and tell everybody you're eligible for vaccine. Well, that's opening up the funnel and not one additional vaccine was made available in the state when that funnel got opened up. So we started with 75 and over, 70 and over, 65 and over, 
60 and over, and we started doing it in a much more manageable way. So we never really had lines out the door and we had appointments only, and it worked out really well. And to date, 66,000 patients and community members, employees, and medical staff have been vaccinated. We have, I share this only not for you to read the whole thing, but to give you a sense of the kinds of dashboards that our teams were using to get a sense of what was going on every day. None of these dashboards existed prior to um, COVID. Again, this is looking at our race and ethnicity data. I'll share this with anybody. I'm not sure that all institutions were looking carefully at their race and ethnicity vaccination rates, but we knew it was gonna be a problem. And when blacks and brown people are dying at two times the rate of whites from COVID, and at four or five years younger than whites who were dying from COVID, we knew vaccine was really important. So we've been talking a lot about vaccine hesitancy, both with our employees as well as the community. We've got va vaccine ambassador programs, equity work groups, we're doing rounding, and you know, the white jack going out and telling the black employees that they should get vaccinated can fall on deaf ears. What I wanted to do was empower our organization to give people information about the benefits of getting vaccine. We are not a mandatory vaccine site yet or vaccine employer yet, but as soon as the FDA fully approves the vaccine beyond the emergency youth authorization, we will give our employees 60 days to be vaccinated because of the belief that we need to protect them and our patients. We did a vaccine roundtable and Michael Nutter, uh, another Jesuit trained um, member of our community went to St. Joe's Prep and St. Joe's University uh, helped us out. So I'll share a little bit of this video. But you go further back in history, and a man by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus was an enslaved African in 1706. And in the Boston smallpox outbreak of 1721, he actually advised his then master on techniques that had been used on the continent of Africa to deal with disease. And of the people who used the technique that he had come up with, very few of them died in that outbreak as compared to the general population. And so for me, it's also respect to the ancestors and those who came before us. Black people have been through a lot in this country, but we're still here. And so I say uh, that uh, I look forward, whenever I get the notice uh, for, uh, for my time uh, to, uh, to come, I'm certainly going to get the vaccine, whichever one they have at that time. I want to be safe. And I want to be around for my family. Uh, and so uh, I would just ask people to think about those things. Yes, there have been some abuses, but there have been some great advances. One was brought to us by an enslaved African. So part of my message is, you know, I'm going to get uh, the vaccine. My wife has already been vaccinated. I want to encourage everyone uh, to do so. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk in past years, but certainly 2020, about Black Lives Matter. Uh, you know, black lives have to matter. And the way you matter is by taking action to protect yourself, to look out for others. There is a community compact that we have, that we are, in fact, our brothers and sisters keeper, that we look out uh, for each other, that we take care of each other. And the way for us to do that is to get as many people as possible vaccinated, get your questions answered, do your own research. Uh, certainly don't get caught up in you know, some of the conspiracy theories uh, that are out there. Uh, that uh, we've been through tough times, we're gonna get through this one. But if you really want to spend time with family, to see people you haven't seen in a long time, uh, then get vaccinated, get most of the country vaccinated, and we can recapture uh, much of our lives back. So Michael did a great job for us, and uh, he continues to be an ambassador for us. He said, I was raised in West Philadelphia, you don't jump the line. And so when his turn came, he actually got vaccinated downtown with the black doctors, COVID black doctors, which was terrific. Uh, it's affected every member of our team. Uh, and I would just say that we couldn't have done and responded to this community. And I don't think any healthcare institution could have responded to their communities without the dedication and uh, willingness and commitment on the part of their, sta or their staff. And so we had people constantly saying, how can I help? We had partners in the community, regional partners, community support. We had people making masks for us. Uh, we had people bringing us food. I call the COVID-19 sort of like the freshman 30, although I don't think it's just 19. I think it's a lot more than 19 that most of us put on a few pounds or our clothes shrunk in the closet. Uh, but a lot of that came from food from the community. 
uh, we had amazing response from our first responders that really this gets me emotional. We had that kind of turnout at every one of our hospitals and uh, the staff were just blown away. They'd be coming into work and firefighters, police officers and EMS personnel were out there applauding them. It was really, really uh, heartwarming. Um, so we continue our commitment to teamwork. Every employee and member of the medical staff brings unique perspective and experience that helps make us make informed decisions. You know, the more diverse that table of people that are making decisions is, the better the decisions you'll make. We've implemented a program called Walk in My Shoes, where we're, as leaders of the organization, getting out and seeing what our staff are experiencing on a regular basis. Uh, I continued, along with my entire management team, working in the institutions. We were in the intensive care units. We were in the emergency departments. And we were very comfortable doing it because we were wearing the same protection that our staff were. You didn't see me go into an intensive care unit with a bubble suit. I was wearing the same face mask that a caregiver at the bedside would be wearing. Um, and I would just close by saying, you know, a thanks to all of our team members. Um, and, and as I said earlier, all of the team members that happen to be uh, members of caregiving teams uh, that are part of the alumni of uh, the University of Scranton. So I did this quick commercial. This is Jack Lynch. I'm outside one of our mainline health emergency departments and I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the healthcare professionals in our region for stepping up during this pandemic. Also thanks to the first responders. All those folks that are on the front line, nurses, physicians, therapists, technicians, and our environmental services workers, all coming together to do what's best and that is to take care of our community during this most difficult time. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing there, Tim, and I'm going to turn it back to you. And again, on behalf of all the communities that you as alumni may be serving either as essential workers or as healthcare providers uh, or members of the community, thanks for being important citizens uh, in this fight against this deadly disease. Jack, thanks for that. It was uh, wonderful to see your insight and to hear the stories uh, that you and your team have experienced over these last 16 months. Uh, I do have to say, I also appreciate the, the upgrade in technology that you brought to us with your presentation. Uh, I was a little worried at first when I started seeing the embedded videos when we did our run through yesterday, um, but I think overall it went really well. So thanks for that. I will tell you, Tim, it does shock people that CEOs know what to do with technology. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, I'm going to, uh, let's ask a few questions here before we, um, before we close it down. But um, one of the questions that came in early on in the registration was, um, how did your pre-pandemic culture, right, that you've been working on for some time as CEO, how did that help you get through those last 16 months? Uh, it's a great question. So Tim, I would say trust is the first thing. I've been here 16 years. I've worked with our management team. Many of them were here before I got here. Um, we have a reputation that if we say something, we're gonna deliver. I'm really, really proud to tell you we never laid an employee off. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to tell you we did have to send employees home and, and they were furloughed. They were all furloughed with pay. Every single employee who called in sick that thought they had COVID, was on company time, not on their paid time off. If you had COVID or you thought you had COVID until you got tested and got a negative test result, we were paying you to stay home because we didn't want you coming to work sick. Uh, we spent in our first pandemic bonus, we paid out $10 million to our rank and file employees, anywhere from $1,000 grossed up to 350, depending on what role. Now, what role a housekeeper that worked in a patient care area that stood next to a nurse in that same patient care area, they both got $1,000. And, okay. and I'm excited that that probably won't be the last pandemic bonus uh, that we hear. And there's some alumni that's gonna reach out to one of my employees tonight and say, I heard a secret. <laughs> and you know, I would just say, don't spend it yet. Um, so I think the culture really is what helped us a lot. The other thing is, 
I didn't have to make all the decisions. We empowered people long before COVID to empower leaders and employees in the front line to do the right thing for patients. And so, you know, I was involved in a lot of decisions and helping think through things, but I, my gut told me and our staff knew that if they were making decisions that were in the best interest of the patient or the best interest of their colleagues, uh, that it was probably the right decision and it would be supported. Great. Uh, someone did ask about, have you financially compensated staff? Um, but the other question was, are you starting to see an exodus of nurses or retirees post pandemic? You know, and how are you addressing some labor shortages? Yeah, I, I think we are seeing people that are just fried. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm out and about enough to see the impact. I, w I was in the ER not long ago with a, a friend whose spot mother was dying, and he was fortunate to be able to be with her because our visiting was back. And it really hit me hard when I realized that for the last 14 months, 13 months, 12 months, whatever it's been, where when we didn't have visitors for anybody, Unless you were end of life and not COVID, there were no visitors. And that meant our staff had to be the family member in addition to the caregiver. And so I think we are going to see people that would have planned to work a little longer and they're just, they're just fried. Um, we hired 100 graduate nurses this year. It's twice the number that we've hired in the past. Um, but we're also seeing an increased demand for our services. And when the board asked me, Jack, what do you attribute that to? Uh, I said management. <laughs> and one of the board members said, you know, I believe that, Jack, but a better answer would have been the board. And I said, yeah, I should have let you tell me it was management. But the bottom line is I think we've got a good reputation. We're surrounded by great providers in this region. Um, but I think the community has responded to us by driving more business our way. And so that makes it challenging to ensure that we're staffing adequately. So I have seen people in, in leadership roles say, I've had enough, uh, but we haven't seen a mass exodus. You mentioned kind of the, the other folks in the other systems in the area. How might have you worked together during those past 12 to 14 months? Unbelievably well. Uh, I was on a call once a week with five of the big systems in Southeast, Southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, talking about our policies, talking about what we were doing, talking about our volume. We shared all of that information. Uh, we shared when we were on drive-by, we shared uh, CHOP was doing some testing for us when they had testing capacity that I didn't have. Um, we were prepared to share personal protective equipment when we had it. Um, I would say one of the benefits that came out of COVID was the collaboration in the region, in the state, and in the country, I think is much, much greater than it was prior to us getting into this. And the bottom line, Tim, it's because yeah. we were all in the same muck. Right. We were all facing the same challenge. Right. I mean, that's been, that's been one constant, right? The world was in this together, right? You know, um, I'll tell you one quick story. And then, yeah. and, um, you know, this was not a big surprise to this country. Uh, for 20 years, we've been hearing from public health officials, there's a pandemic coming. And I compare it with uh, Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf. For 20 years, the Army Corps of Engineers said there's going to be a flood and it's going to wipe out New Orleans. And uh, band-aids were put on it, just like there were band-aids put on preparing for a pandemic and all of a sudden there was a storm in the gulf and new orleans got wiped out and you know they talk about it not being a, a natural disaster they talk about it being a social disaster uh by the time the patients arrived or people got sick in new york and on the west coast it was too late we couldn't gear up the ppe we couldn't gear up the testing capacity all our national stockpiles never contemplated the entire world needing the same supplies at the same time, it was too late. So one of the things we have to learn from this pandemic is it's going to happen again. And we gotta be a hell of a lot better prepared the next time, knowing that it, it can happen. Right. We have a couple of questions about, um, you mentioned the vaccines and some of the outreach you've done to the uh, minority black and brown communities. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about how that effort's gonna continue and then, and then in addition to that, someone mentions that in the New York Times today, there's an article about some uh, health, hospital employees that are signing petitions against the vaccine and, and those policies. So yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And I'm gonna be careful not to be critical of the handful of institutions around the country, not universities, because they're all leading the, the way on vaccine requirements, uh, but on hospitals. Uh, the Houston Methodist Hospital was the first, Penn was right there, 
maybe the second uh, requiring and mandating that vaccine. I think there's really good reasons they're doing it, and I understand why they're doing it. I'm just not comfortable, and my institution's not comfortable mandating a vaccine that only has emergency youth, youth emergency youth, emergency use authorization. Um, that's not meaning that it's experimental. It is not experimental. It's got an emergency use authorization. But once it's FDA approved, my experts are telling me, Jack, it's just like the flu vaccine. It's got FDA approval. We've been requiring the flu vaccine for 10 years. We require the flu vaccine because we have an obligation to be prepared to respond to the community in the event that the community needs us. If 50% of the community along the main line has the flu and 50% of my employees have the flu, I cannot meet the needs and the healthcare needs of the community. No different. If there's a COVID outbreak and my employees are all out sick and there were days where we had 150 to 200 people furloughed, I've lost four employees who died from COVID. I've had tens of, if not more than that, employees hospitalized. Uh, and I look at those deaths and those hospitalizations today as 100% preventable. There are medical reasons you shouldn't get vaccinated. There are religious exemptions. Those two will be put in place. They'll be difficult to figure out and the clinicians will figure out how we manage the medical and the religious exemptions. Uh, but the bottom line is when you look at the risk reward of getting the vaccine versus not getting the vaccine, all the scientists will tell you is that getting the vaccine is better than the risks that are associated. You may not die, but 10% of the people that get COVID have what is described in the general public as long hauler syndrome. And when you listen and hear about some of the symptoms that those people continue to have months and months after their initial COVID diagnosis, the vaccine makes sense. Right, right. You talked about um, getting ready for the next one, right? So someone asked in preparation for the next major health event, what are you doing to balance the economics of minimizing beds and supplies with the need to accelerate and expand quickly? So what are some of those lessons you learned that you can implement in the future? Tim, I would tell you that's the next presentation. One, because I haven't <laughs> figured it out, but two, it's, it's a big issue. And the bottom line is, you know, I was hearing from payers up until the day the pandemic started about how much I had spent on campus master planning, how many buildings we had, how many beds we had, you know, um, and you would have thought that, you know, we were way oversupplied. You heard there are parts of the country that are, quote, way overbedded. There wasn't a part of this country that was overbedded during the pandemic. And so I think it's got to give us all a fresh look. The other thing is, is healthcare workers. I mean, I had more capacity in beds than I did workforce. And, you know, I did something that was not really well received, but I asked our employees not to go to New York and volunteer. And it wasn't well received because people said, I want to go help New York, or I want to go help Michigan, or I want to. And my only response was, I get it, but I'm going to need you here when that virus migrates its way down 95. And in fact, it did migrate down 95, and I did need those people. And so I think in a case where you've got a global pandemic, the concept of flying nurses in from New York or flying nurses in from California, it all goes out the window. And so, you know, I think having personnel, you know, I'll give you another example. When CVS and Rite Aid got the contract to do the vaccinations in all of the skilled nursing and nursing homes, they didn't have a workforce to do that. They had to hire temporary help. Where do you think they got the temporary help? From hospitals. And so, you know, I think we all were sort of fighting with each other. The good news is I don't think the acute care providers were fighting with each other. We weren't stealing each other's employees. The question about, you know, the collaboration, again, more collaboration among our regional and, and statewide um, hospital association members was a model. The other really unknown is are we going to rely on a third, I mean, on a, on a foreign country for personal protective equipment? Um, I don't know that many of you know this, but there are two companies in the world that produce the nasal swabs that are used for testing. One is in Japan and one is in Maine. And the one in Maine that produces the most is two cousins that hate each other and we're in legal battles with each other. And we in this country were at risk of not having enough swabs because we have one company in Maine that was providing them. And so I think the country needs to look very carefully at where are we getting and relying on the supplies. And we're seeing this in every part of our economy right now, as things got shut down and have not been completely ramped back up, we're now all experiencing the shortages of what happened when those suppliers and manufacturers stopped their work. Great. Um, 
one question about that collaboration. Did that include help with kind of overflow on the patient side? Yes. When you yes. That was much easier to do. For example, Mainline Health, we moved patients. We would, we would stop admitting patients to Lankanaw, admit them to Bryn Mawr, or stop admitting patients to Riddle. So we did uh, demand matching, you know, where we had capacity. Um, we did that a little bit, but the truth is most of us in southeastern Pennsylvania were hitting our peaks around the same time. Uh, and right. you could look in pockets of, of Philadelphia and see in North Philadelphia, you saw a spike going up and you knew it was just a matter of a couple of days before it was going to start migrating across town. Great. Um, let's just go one more question. So you mentioned your next presentation, your next webinar. I've got two. The first one is someone's interested in what your statistics grades were. <laughs> uh, Dr. Gujan went out at Easter time. <laughs> I needed a full semester to pass uh, statistics, and she left in the middle of the semester, and we had to take our exams earlier. And needless to say, it wasn't a surprise because she knew she was pregnant. So I had the privilege of taking Dr. Gujan's statistics class a second time. <laughs> But we didn't rely on Jack's statistics at Mainline Health or his capabilities. I knew enough to ask what questions, uh, and I had experts that could answer the questions. That's where the teamwork comes in, right? That's right. Last, last question. Um, have you had a chance to get some vacation in the last year or two? Yeah, yeah, I have. And I get away every weekend. We have a place down on the Eastern Shore, and, and that's all about our health. And, and we had an employee today at the town hall say, are we going to get to carry over our vacation time in 2021 because we can't use it? And I said sort of sarcastically, no, I, I don't want you to be able to carry your vacation time over. I want you to use it now. It's not something that we're interested in seeing you bank and then, you know, eventually having a big bolus where you can take it. Uh, we, for your health, you need to be taking your vacations. Now, the truth is, and I said this on the town hall, if I'm not going to burn a bunch of people out of vacation pay if they couldn't take vacation. But for the last 14 months, we've asked people not to take vacation. Now what we're up against is someone wants to go to Europe and we're not real comfortable with people leaving the country yet and not having to be furloughed. So there are people that are not ready to do a staycation. So um, I do get away on the weekends. Um, all our team members are expected to get away. I interviewed a guy uh, a couple months ago for a senior level job, and he told me, I've been in the command center for 53 days straight. And I'm thinking, that's not a team member that I want. I want someone that's willing to do it, but I want a structure in place where no one has to be working that many hours. The other thing we did very carefully, particularly with our caregivers, is we were monitoring their hours of work. And they work more than 40 hours a week for a long time. But we had a cap on the number of hours. I want to tell you it was 60, but we had a cap on the number of hours that they could work for their own health and for the health of our patients. And so, um, but, you know, as soon as that peak starts hitting and you start getting those higher tiers, you know, it really starts pressing staff and they don't want to walk out on their colleagues. But our employees' health and them getting away, even if, if it's for a staycation, is really, really important. Well, I, I think that's a common theme that I've heard you say. So, I, I, and I appreciate that. I, I'm sure your employees greatly appreciate that the, the concept of making sure you keep the patient's health in addition to your employees' health first and foremost. Because if you don't have healthy employees, you're not going to be able to take care of your patients. So, you know, again, I'll share one last story. Yeah. We have an we have an intensive care unit that probably cared for the most number of COVID positive patients that we had, and. Uh, and certainly the sickest because it was at Lankanaw. And I don't believe that they had one positive COVID test result of an employee who got exposed and got the virus at work. And you know, the bottom line is if you wear the PPE and you're careful, um, the likelihood of you getting the virus was very low. Uh, but complacency hit in. We, we'd go into a into a, a break room and see five nurses eating lunch too close to one another and their masks down and it's all natural but our biggest problem internally was employee to employee exposure in break rooms yep. tim thanks for the extra time it's been a privilege i'm a proud alum of the university of scranton it's fun to be back in pennsylvania and not in texas having people say scranton where is that uh, so I love my roots of my four years at Scranton, and I'm a proud uncle of a presidential scholar who's at the university now and loves it 
and a shout out to Kathleen Wallace and all of her classmates for the last year that they've been through uh, with COVID. It's not the same as it was for when all of us were in school. And I hope they get back to normal next year. All right. Well, again, Jack, I can't thank you enough. I'm going to bring Frank in to see if there's any closing thoughts, but uh, awesome job. And we appreciate that presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, nothing to say after that, Jack, fantastic. It, it was great hearing from you, and watching what you and your team did, uh, remarkable. So thank you so much. Thanks, Frank. We saw a lot of comments in the, in the Q&A also. So on behalf of everyone who joined us, um, thank you. And uh, allow me to give you a round of applause, but also wish you a happy birthday on the eve of tomorrow's <laughs> birthday for you. Well done. That's a good development officer. <laughs> <laughs> And I would, just say, I would just say to all of the folks that are on this call today, uh, don't forget the university and their needs. Um, I'm also a proud donor. And, um, you know, those of us that have been fortunate enough to do well in our careers owe at least some of that to our education at the University of Scranton. And there are so many kids that are not as fortunate as many, and they need our support. And so I hope if you have not already engaged with the development office at the university, uh, and many of you probably have already, I would really encourage you to do it because it feels as good to give it away as it does to make it, in fact, better. Well, amen to that, Jack. I mean, I, I, maybe I'll just close up with that, but, but I appreciate <laughs> that very much. Um, I also want to thank um, Frank and, and Elizabeth. I want to thank Jeff Gingrich, um, my colleague Sarah Efforts for all of her work in helping this uh, get, get through the, the evening. Um, I also want to thank our guys behind the scenes who are not on camera. And that's Jason Wimmer and Jason Oki in our IT department. Um, and just as a reminder, tonight's webinar was recorded. So we will have that available on our website in the next few days. Uh, and finally, just as a brief update, Frank alluded to it earlier, our current plan right now uh, is to be able to gather in person in some form on October 7th in New York at the Pierre Hotel to celebrate our 20th annual dinner. Uh, we will continue to monitor the safety and the progress of other groups who are doing events like this between now and, and the fall. Um, and we will be sharing some additional details in the near future. So again, thank you all for attending. We look forward to seeing you at our next PBC webinar and hopefully uh, soon at an in-person event. We're now gonna shut down uh, the presenters' videos and microphones, put up our thank you slide and ask you to leave the meeting, which is a button at the bottom right of your corner, uh, bottom right of your screen. Thanks again for everything. And again, uh, be safe. Hopefully we'll see you soon.